in my opening statement, the illusion of doom and gloom. Well, this year, 2021, is slowly coming to an end. This Friday, I'll be breaking down uh, with a special panel on a special presentation of Gatesville as to what defined the past year on our special episode, Flashback 2021. Make sure you join us for that. Uh, that will be on the, this Friday at 6.30 p.m. Now, most of you would have your take on the EFS Summit. It would have been an excellent year, much better than 2020, and for others, well, a challenging one. We just finished celebrating Christmas, and if we are to believe what is said about this country on social media, on mainstream media, on radio, or in the newspaper, or even on our 655 News Bulletin, well, then this country has to be in the gutter. Going by that theory, people should be queuing up for food, fuel, essential services. Is that happening? Well, that's precisely what the clown clan and the opposition tries to do on a daily basis. Do their level best to portray this country as a shithole country. As long as they can create chaos for the sake of creating chaos, they think they can be in power the very next day. So what's the reality? Is Sri Lanka as bad as they scream on social media? For the love of Christ, just go get off your keyboard and go outside. Now, in the past few days, hotels in Colombo, all hotels in Colombo, have seen the highest bookings they've seen in a pandemic time. The highest since 2019. Rooms to tables to everything they have. Every single night, all hotels in Colombo are running at full capacity. Shopping malls have seen the highest number of patronage. I mean, I've witnessed this uh, by myself. Every single night, there's a very long queue at one golf. It's the most expensive shopping complex currently in Sri Lanka. And no, they are not queuing to beg for food, but go inside to have fun. Shopping malls have now become like exclusive clubs where there's always a long line filled with people hoping to get inside to just have a bit of fun. All tourist destinations in the country, in Nuarelia, Kandy, Anuradhapura, Sigiri, are filled with people excited to enjoy life and get on with theirs. People are spending their money and enjoying themselves despite the tough times. Because for most in this country, the doom and gloom portrayed by the media, on social media, on every single channel, including ours, and the jokes cracked by the clowns at the opposition, they don't believe a single word of that. They just want to enjoy life. I mean, ask yourself how many parties or outings or weddings, for that matter, you've been part of in the last few weeks. However, there's a bunch of losers, in my opinion, sitting at home, hammering away on the keyboard, thinking as long as they portray a terrible visual of Sri Lanka's image, saying no dollars, no food, no this, no that, of course, they don't have those because uh, they have not been able to achieve anything in their life. So for them, yes, negativity rules the day. So what are you saying, Mahesh? There aren't any real problems, you might ask, of course. You, sh you have the right to ask. I know. That's not what I'm saying at all. Problems will continue to be there until the end of time. That's a fact. From the very first day Adam and Eve was created, if you believe uh, in the story of creation, they had problems. It's not about having problems, it's about what you do to solve them. There's an awesome quote uh, by Matt Damon uh, in the movie The Martian, really good movie, where he says, uh, in the end, uh, to a bunch of students, uh, if you remember this movie, he says, you just begin, you do the math, you solve one problem, and you solve the next one and the next one. And if you solve enough problems, you get to come home. Yeah, Sri Lanka has an economic problem, one big massive issue right now, which will impact our ability to exchange with the world. We do have a big problem about our food cultivation due to the lousy picture painted about a good thing. Due to erroneous actions of a few recently, we even had problems with our gas products. But the question is, are people there who's up at the helm working on solutions for them? And the answer is yes. And that's what matters. 
And if they are, then you got to put your best foot forward and walk with your head held high. Because having a mind of negativity will never get you anywhere in life. All right, when we return uh, after the break, I'll sit down with Professor Rohan Gunaratna, the Director General of the Institute of National Security Studies to discuss an impending threat to the region. However, before that, to start us off on the matter, I'm now joined by Danidu Vitanwa Samwa with a look at the real story tonight. Good evening, Danidu. Um, good to see you once again. Um, uh, I hope you had a good break uh, during last week, uh, enjoying the festivities around Colombo. Uh, with regard to uh, the regional issues in terms of extremism, what exactly is your focus tonight? Uh, good evening again, Maisha, and yes, uh, just a good break, a break that <laughs> the entire country deserves. Um, the focus for the real story would be, I think we, 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 we have spoken about this for quite some time, and it is going to be on this issue of extremism. And I believe you will uh, go into details uh, on that aspect I within the program. But to give a context and to give the bigger picture, and thereby to give sort of like a standing for where the discussion can take place, that is where the real story uh, really is focusing on. Now, extremism in the South Asian region has been a core point of concern in the recent past, given the push by the region to bring in investments, especially here in Sri Lanka. But what exactly is the situation on the ground when it comes to the spread of extremism? The economic challenges in South Asia in particular have been a complementary factor to the amelioration of certain extremist groups that in most instances consolidate to form terrorist organizations. This was quite evident when looking at the rise of the Taliban in Afghanistan, which had a historic context but gained traction due to rising poverty. The cause of the rise of extremism is multifaceted and finding its source is a process that has been studied for long periods of time. Most nations within the South Asian region have taken a strong stance against extremism, which is an effort that has been pushed for by Sri Lanka's current administration. A good atmosphere for ideologies outside mainstream politics have been allowed to rise up given the pandemic's influence on global supply chains. In order to understand this, the recent past provides some very good examples, even within Sri Lanka, which was manifested through the Easter Sunday attacks. Prior to moving to any conclusions pertaining to the Sialkot atrocity, it should be understood that the city in question was not a primitive or less urbanized area. It was quite the opposite. The data released by the Pakistan Bureau of Statistics in the year 2020 identifies Punjab, which is the province Sialkot is within, to be the most literate province within the country. The city of Sialkot alone holds a literacy rate of over 78% as per 2020. In terms of living standards, it comes third, led only by Lahore and Rawalpindi from the entire country. Sialkot is an industrial hub within Pakistan, becoming the country's largest sports and surgical goods exporting hub. Sialkot has 1,500 major and over 10,000 small industrial units scattered around the city and its suburbs. This goes to show that the 19 square kilometer city is far from being a secluded area with no reach to modernization. It is in this backdrop that the supporters of the Tariq e Labaik Pakistan group conducted this heinous crime. It must be understood that just in October this year, Prime Minister Imran Khan had released over 350 supporters of the TLP as a measure in favor of the removal of the organization's ban in the country. Saad Hussein Rizvi, the leader of the organization, was also released in November. The murder of Priyanka can be considered as one of the first public acts of discontent after the TLP group is now consolidating its effort against the government. The leadership has gone on to urge the people to vote for them in the upcoming general elections. Unfortunately, the gravity of the act isn't displayed quite as explicitly as done by the Prime Minister from other parts of the government. The Defence Minister was seen making a form of justification of the act by suggesting it was the youth being emotional and shouldn't affect the long-term relations the TLP has with the government. Another catastrophic incident was the Taliban takeover of Afghanistan for the second time, first in 1996 and now in 2021. A number of important parallels can be drawn between the situation in Pakistan and that of Afghanistan. Prior to the Taliban, individual extremist groups under the name of Mujahideen were present around the nation. Given their internal conflicts and years of external influences, the only consolidated organization to bring a certain amount of peace to at least regional areas of Afghanistan was the Taliban, which began as a student movement in Kandahar. The US invasion of Afghanistan in 2001 and the extended military influence with the so-called nation-building effort gave prominence to the Taliban's novel effort to bring together all types of Afghanistani nationals in order to rise up against the foreign military occupation. The ideology was far easier to sell as the general public was poor, 
without proper leadership and US institutions didn't reflect the Afghanistani culture. Volatile situations created such as this and the most recent incident in Pakistan. It can be made clear that a growing contest between mainstream politics and domestic extremist groups that feed on people's emotions have sprung up. In extension, Bangladesh had also seen recent religious riots. It began after the circulation of a picture of the Holy Quran at the feet of a Hindu statue. Hundreds of people have protested in Bangladesh's capital Dhaka, calling for an end to religious violence. At least six people have died and several others injured. The picture, as in the case of Pakistan, was considered to be blasphemy against Islam. Police said more than 200 attackers beat and stabbed to death an executive member of the Temple Committee in the southern town of Begum Ganj, where members of the Hindu community were preparing to perform the last rites of the 10-day Durga Puja festival. Prime Minister Sheikh Hasina's government has responded by temporarily blocking high-speed internet in several areas, deploying paramilitary units to some 35 of the country's districts, and arresting scores of people, including activists supporting Bangladesh's main opposition parties. These reports show that the situation in Pakistan is certainly not an isolated event and the threat of extremism is spreading far across the region of South Asia. Regional stability flows into all facets of a country's development. The South Asian leadership should take a more comprehensive and calculated approach when dealing with something such as extremism, given its current situation. Mahesh, I believe there are a lot of areas that we can cover into this program. <coughs> Indeed, uh, one of the uh, key areas I think we need to get uh, an understanding is what can the region do, what can uh, Sri Lanka do, and more or less it's not about just pointing the finger at one ethnicity and trying to say it's everybody's pro uh, it's only their problem, but then again try to understand how we can collectively do um, our part to make sure that this extremism, this menace go away from society. All right, uh, Danidu, thank you very much. Uh, Danidu Tanavasam with a uh, look at the real story there. Let's take a short commercial break on the other side. Professor Rohan Gunaratne, the Director General of the Institute of National Security Studies in Sri Lanka, will be here. This is Get Real. Be back in a minute.